Welcome to Rock Shop Talk, your official podcast from rock.us, available wherever you get your podcasts and broadcast live on Zoom each week, designed to empower you to be the greatest screen printing professional you can be. For details, please visit rock.us slash rock shop talk. President and general manager Ross Hunter and guests discuss all things screen printing and ideas to help you press onward. Best practices, silly anecdotes, the latest on cutting edge technology in the field. Today's episode features the topic of finance, and we're joined by our special guests, Steve and Denise Mangini of Primal Tea Shop, and Greg Borden, that's me, and Ryan Mack of CIT. So I want to welcome everyone to Rock Shop Talk. I'm Ross Hunter, alongside of our creative uh, producer, Meryl Caps and Shelly McClendon of our accounting department. Hey, hey. We are going to be doing a whole episode about finance, all of our favorite thing, mm-hmm. money and how to spend it, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so we're joined today by a special guest, uh, Steve and Denise Mangini of Primal Tea Shop. Uh, we've got Greg Borden. Did I say your name, last name right, Greg? Uh, you got it. Yeah, Greg Borden. You got it. Greg Don't Borden. It's not said fancy. Boom. <laughs> of CIT. And we got Ryan Mack of CIT with us as well, joining us from uh, New Hampshire. Um, and Stephen and Denise, you guys are out in Jersey, Upstate correct? New York. Upstate New York. Awesome. Um, so before we get started, our tour bus is almost done. We're about uh, two and a half weeks away from having it completed. So excited to share that with everyone. Hopefully get out on the road uh, very soon. Uh, we're all feeling, I think, a little bit cooped up from uh, all of the, the fun that has been ensuing uh, around the world and now specifically in our country. So it'll be fun to get out there, see our customers, see how people are doing and, uh, you know, start start kind of a new movement so really excited about that um want to remind everyone to follow the tour when we come through your town uh hashtag rock us tour it's roq us tour um you can follow it on facebook linkedin twitter instagram and thank you so much for joining us today so we're going to go through uh quite a few different topics that have to do with uh, finance today uh how to purchase capital equipment, basically what it takes both from the banking aspect uh, with CIT, Greg and and Ryan joining us there. From a customer standpoint, Stephen Denise, welcome to the Rock family. I believe you guys just got your uh, new press delivered. You named her Rhoda, I believe. Is that correct? I like it. Rock and Rhoda. Rock and Rhoda. I love it. So... (laughs) Got some new customers, i.e. partners, because we're changing our language here. So we got new partners in crime. Uh, Welcome to the Rock family here um, that finance through CIT. And then we've got our amazing accountant, uh, Ms. Shelly McClendon, joining us from the Rock team, who deals with all the lovely back-end paperwork and sales agreements and funding that comes through. So we'll get kind of a multitude of different perspectives on finance and what it takes to get into um, some automated equipment. Yeah. Awesome. Um, So I want to start out uh, just kind of addressing CIT. We've had a relationship here for about, I want to say five years. Um, I've been with the company for two now and I know it kind of started before I joined and then we really sort of kicked it off pretty in a pretty big way about two, two and a half years ago. Can you guys talk a little bit about why CIT got into this industry? What brought you to it? Sort of the history of um, what what brought you to us and into this industry? I can kind of kick it off there. Um, so, as far as the the industry, uh, CIT has been uh, lending into the overall printing space for almost two decades, um, and. You know, like like Ross, I'm I'm a little newer to the company. I've been with the company for about five years. Um, you know, we were a little smaller at the time when we were looking to start to diversify and get into some different industries. Um, we had some some print customers here and there. It seemed to be a, a, a stable industry uh, with with some customers that were re- reliable. Um, and I believe Greg was part of the team that you know really started to uh, work its way into print. Um, so I'll kind of, you know, let Greg talk a little more about that if, if he's comfortable. 
Yeah, no, I mean, if you if we think about the industry as a whole, right, and we think about what CIT has always been good at, it's a it's about embracing kind of like entrepreneurs. Like we we want to be able to provide financing to small business owners that are starting out, growing, adding equipment. Um, so what, you know, like what better industry than the print space for that, right? So in many cases, we might have a relatively new small company buying some of their first equipment, and we get to grow with them over time, right? And making sure that we continue to provide access to capital is what makes that happen. Um, it's just really the fact that this industry is a really good natural fit for that, with that evolution over time. Um, you know, I remember going to some of my first trade shows in, in print, and whether it's people doing shirts or they're doing other types of media or whatever it is. But I always liked hearing the story of, you know, I, I started this business in my garage you know, after hours and, and look where we are now, or, you know, now my kids are taking over this business or whatever it may be. Uh, and to me, that was always really exciting. So I, I think, you know, we got heavily involved in the space, I think just in, in some ways out of a, out of a passion for it and being able to embrace that story. So um, it's really cool work. We're, we're excited to see where it continues to go. Um, we've seen all the trends changing with digital, um, you know, digital printing right up through now, with, you know, automatic presses now for, for shirts and stuff. It's just, um, you know, eco-friendly stuff coming out, right? It's just, uh, it's incredibly uh, uh, exciting environment for us to be in. I mean, you know, hey, we're in banking, right? So like, everybody's most fun people are always the bankers, right? So uh, we're, we're fortunate to be involved in the space. Well, I will say, you know, when I came on board and uh, first met, I think it was Josh Labossier was taking care of our account at the time, and I believe was the one on you guys' team that onboarded us. I, uh, I decided to take a trip out to New Hampshire, see your facility. And I remember walking in and you guys immediately had all your values on the wall. And, you know, it, it really kind of touched me because when you walk into our space, same thing, we really live by our values and, you know, seeing that you were about the entrepreneur and not about the money, not about closing the deal, but really about helping businesses grow, being a part of that growth. Um, you know, that's what we're here for. And, you know, people don't think that, right. They think, Oh, these guys sell equipment. Great. Another salesperson trying to sell me something, but you know, and, and Steve and Denise probably can speak to this even better dealing with us for the last, you know, little over a year and a half now, you know, our goal was to see them grow and it didn't matter how we got there. Um, I'll kind of let you guys actually tell a little bit of, of that story because I think it's, it's better coming from you than me. So I'll, I'll let uh, Denise and Steve kind of talk about how this all came to be and how it really ties that message of entrepreneurial, you know, growth minded companies coming in to help someone, um, get to where they want to go well when we had first met you at the iss show in atlantic city uh we had just dabbled into screen printing so everything was just a, a small manual printer small electric dryer so forth but now we've gotten to the point where at first we were looking at a dryer so ross you've always kept in contact with us it, it's it's been wonderful we never had the pressure, but at first Steve reached out to you because I was about ready to throw that dryer out in the road. So <laughs> it was time to upgrade. Um, so at first we were looking at dryers and then all of a sudden this, this, the whole automatic equipment just kind of fell into our laps and Ross and Chris at CIT have been nothing but wonderful with the whole process. Um, it's been very smooth. Uh, we have not been pushed into purchasing anything. Uh, you've always been there for us, whether it's a text, a phone call, an email. Um, it, it's, it's been wonderful. So well, what's kind of cool, too, is, you know, you guys actually ended up buying another one of our customer shops. Yes. So it was kind of like liaisoning you, you know, through that process and this great deal came up, which not only helped you guys, it actually helped the other company too, because it was yeah. something that they were looking um, to kind of get out from doing they're, They've shifted their business a little bit. I mean, they're still in business. They're still working. They're still doing jobs. And now they might use you guys to do some of their contract printing. 
So it's kind of this whole evolution of like a year and a half of conversations and, and going through this process to get to that point where it it feels like everyone wins. We've got, you know, a new, a new family member joining us, you know, CIT was able to, to help guide you through the finance part of the business. And, you know, we were able to help another customer along the way, who's now going to help you, you know, hopefully grow and, and get more business. So, and, and I think that, you know, that that's what Greg was saying. It really resonates. It's just a bunch of people helping people grow and yes. uh, really cool. Really cool. Yeah. Um, so another question uh, over to CIT, you know, there's a lot of finance companies out there that, you know, may look like a bank or feel like a bank, but they might not be a bank. Are you guys a bank? Is this your money? Uh, we are. We used to not be a bank, but we are a bank. Um, it's funny, and I'll let Ryan expand on it, right? But you know, I, I've been I've been working out of the same building in Portsmouth for the last fifteen years, uh, doing the same thing, right? So we've gone through a name change, but being being part of CIT is tremendous. Um, you know, when when we first became part of a, a bank, like I had some concern. I'm like, oh, geez, you know regulation. What does that mean for us? Is it going to make us, you know, less nimble, things like that? Um, What it turns out is that being part of a bank and being regulated is actually a really good thing. Um, So we've been fortunate enough to to be part of that. Um, Ryan, I'll let you expand on that. But, you know, it's certainly something that I, you know, I didn't give much thought to being even in the banking industry, right, Uh, on how important that was. And now, um, especially with what goes on today, like how important it really is to have a bank that can weather the storms of, of what you see in the economy or protecting identity and things like that. Yeah. I, I think Greg kind of nailed it on the, on the head there. I'm not, I'm not sure how much I can really provide on that. I mean, simply stated, yeah, yes, we are, we are a bank. We're, we're probably uh, a little less, less of a household name seeing as we are a, uh, a commercial bank. We don't, we don't dabble in a lot of, uh, deposits um, or, or some of the, the personal side of things. Um, but we are a, a FDIC regulated bank and, and we certainly have the, the privilege of being able to lend uh, across all 50 states. So I think that's, you know, certainly a, a benefit. Um, and, and Greg has some of that legacy in him. I, I was hired under, under CIT's purchase. So I, I didn't experience the world prior to that, but um, you know, it's been, a, it's been an awesome journey and, you know, certainly, feel blessed to be to be part of a, a big bank that can you know weather some of this stuff absolutely and I mean just so our viewers kind of understand because you're your own bank does that you know reflect in the rates that you're able to offer people generally I mean does does any of that change because you're lending direct um, compared to you know brokering a deal per se oh for sure like I mean I I get, I get people that want to refer me deals all the time. That could be like, I don't know them from a hole in the wall. Right. But they're representing themselves with like, Hey, we're, you know, we're a lender. We'll help you get equipment finance. And then ultimately all they're doing is they're calling us and, and, and they're usually looking for some participation fee or something like that. But, um, usually, yeah, I mean, it's going to get marked up, right. If there's someone in the middle, um, we do have, we do have our own deposits. We're public, right. So we raise funds that way too. Right. Cause we're a public company. Um, we do have deposits for business checking accounts, um, you know, in, in, in some of our acquisitions. Like we, we recently acquired a couple of other banks, um, so that all helps us out tremendously, right? If, if we can get deposits and we can lend that money off of our own balance sheet directly to the con- consumer or the, or the purchaser, you know, we're going to pass that savings on. It makes us all more competitive. Absolutely. And you guys have gotten to the point where – sorry, Ryan, but you guys have gotten to the point where you – actually like people can physically bank there. I know that, I mean, just telling our viewers, we actually bank with you. So you guys are our checking account for rock us as well, which is kind of cool to have this really neat relationship where you've got your lending. I know you guys do factoring for a lot of uh, different companies uh, within the industry as well. You know, you can have a checking account, you can have a savings account, you can run credit cards through. So it's kind of like a one-stop shop, you know, of, of solutions for people in this industry. And I think, uh, just, just touching base, t- touching back on, you know, if we're an actual bank, I think, uh, you know, us being a, a bank certainly helps from, you know, a, a customer standpoint as well, not necessarily on the rate side, but, 
you know, some of the other lenders out there that maybe aren't a bank, you know, are, are, are not holding that paper. They're not, they're not communicating with that customer. Um, I think it adds a lot of value that, you know, uh, Steve and Denise will always have Chris to call. They'll have a dedicated finance manager that will be able to assist them as they look to expand their business. Um, and, and as Greg mentioned, you know, we're always looking to, you know, grow with our partners. You know, you, you get that with a big bank that's always looking to, you know, work with you and, and help provide capital where it's needed when you're looking to expand or grow your business. So I think, I think that that's an even, an even deeper piece. Um, not only, you know, cheaper rates. Awesome. Yeah, Very cool. You know, they're, they're especially you think about now, right? If people are having difficulty making their obligations or they have questions about what's happening, being able to call and get an answer directly from who you borrowed from is like really important rather than getting passed around or something like that. So um, I, you know, sometimes I forget how large CIT is, you know, we can be like the elephant out there, but, um, uh, you know, in a lot of ways we, we do have that small, you know, small bank feel that personal touch. Um, I think that's why we've been so successful. Absolutely. Well, I know I've definitely felt that from a vendor side. I mean, we have dealt with many, many, many different lenders throughout the years and, you know, the bond and the relationship, you know, and that kind of, you know, small bank feel that you guys have brought to the table definitely, makes a big impact, not, not just for our customers, but for our team too. Like, you know, Shelly has to, you know, deal with you guys probably on a daily basis, right? Pretty often. Yeah. <laughs> and, and there's always someone there. That there's answers always the phone, someone yeah. there. That's or true. Like, I just wanted to mention too, you know, Ross said we bank with CIT. So Rock US banks with the division of CIT. So I want to make sure that our customers know, or our partners know that there's not a conflict of interest here, that we're not we're not promote. We're not selling CIT services because we benefit in any way. We're a customer of CIT. We have we have a checking account and a savings account with a division of CIT. I just think it's important to mention that. Yeah, and all those departments are actually separate. Your factoring division is separate, I believe. Your equipment financing separate. Banking separate. So you guys, I mean, it's a it's a big company, and there's just it's a, a lot company. of different things happening in, in different divisions. Yeah, I, I play a lot of matchmaker internally, as some of the other people you've <laughs> talked to, right? And you get me in touch with somebody in factoring. I need a supply chain finance deal. I mean, we even got a rail car division. So if anybody on this <laughs> podcast is thinking they want to go into the rail business, call me up. I'll help you finance a train. You know? so <laughs> oh, nice. I'll figure it out for you. Ross, I've always you wanted ideas. a train. <laughs> Can Rock buy a train? I like where this is going. Yeah, you know, we'll, well, actually, you know, maybe that'll be the next tour. We'll see, you know. Uh, uh, yeah. You know, the, when, when you're done with the tour bus, we'll, we'll look at a, a tour train. So. so we'll go like tour bus, oh train, and then like G6. Oh, yeah. I'm thinking, like, like, <laughs> fly like a I like it. I like where you're yeah. going with that. All right. Me too. <laughs> <laughs> so kind of taking us back to, you know, sort of the history of our relationship and stuff. What what specifically does this industry itself mean to, to you guys like you know I know you're involved in a ton of different industries from tech to automotive you know printing being one of those what what does this mean you know to you guys and your team what's special about this industry to you yeah I mean um, so you know with our that extensive time we've we've spent in the industry we've really been able to you know gather a lot of knowledge um, certainly with, with rock customers and, and everything you guys have helped us, you know, learn and grow, but we really understand what it means, uh, when someone is moving from a, you know, auto, you know, a, a manual press into an automatic rock, you know, what does that look like for the business? Um, you know, I, I think it just brings joy to, you know, myself and, and the rest of the team that helps out in this space, um, to know that we're helping a lot of our partners, you know, not only realize business goals, but in many instances, you know, realize some of their dreams as well. Um, and then again, it may be the manual to the automatic, you know, or it may be, uh, you know, adding another automatic. What does that mean for the business? How are we helping? So I think it just, you know, kind of allows us to, to take some joy in our job and know that we're actually helping people um, achieve, you know, business goals and dreams. Awesome. Very cool. Well, uh, we're going to take another quick break here. And uh, when we come back, uh, we'll get into credit and differences between different types of lending and, and kind of get a good overview of sort of the nitty gritty into finance. So we'll be right back. 
Rock.us products are available across North America with our distributing partners. Woohoo Screen Print Supplies, Northwest Graphics Supply Company, Lancer Group International, NorCal Screen Print Supply, Reese Supply Company, River City Graphics Supply, Ryanair, Tube Light, Vastex, Advanced Screen Print Supply, and Ink Tech. For more information, please visit rock.us. That's R O Q.us. Or call 1 87 Rocket Now. That's 1 877 674 8669. So, welcome back to Rock Shop Talk, your one stop rock shop. I love our. Uh creative producer over here, Merrill. He likes to give me tongue twisters in these things. <laughs> He's so good at it. <laughs> Today, uh, we're joined by our special guest, Stephen Denise Mangini of Primal Tea Shop, along with Greg Borden and Ryan Mack of CIT, and uh, the lovely Miss uh, Shelly McClendon from our own accounting department. Uh, there we go, yeah. All right, so uh, let's jump back in. Um, a lot of people want to know you know, they're shopping, they're looking, obviously finance is a sort of scary thing. I, I went through this personally, what, uh, 12 years ago when I bought my first automatic press. And I remember being at a trade show and I remember shopping and uh, I remember deciding, hey, I think I'm going to go through with this, but I had to fill out finance paperwork. I mean, I, I didn't have the cash at the time. I think I was, I don't know how old I was. 20 something. And, uh, by the way, I didn't tell my wife I was doing this, which was a very bad move after I got home. So kudos to Steve and Denise for shopping together at the trade show. My wife wasn't with me, but that's a different, 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 yeah, (laughs) Oh, that's a good one. So the question is, you know, what happens to someone's credit after they fill out that application? A lot of people are nervous to fill those things out. I know, in the past, like when I've bought vehicles and stuff, you know, my credit will get pulled 15 or 16 times um, just to get, you know, one approval so they can shop rates. What does that look like with CIT? What does it do to someone's credit? What should they kind of be aware of and think about before filling out that app? Um, You know, in terms of best results, that was a lot of questions. So we'll start with uh, what actually happens to their credit uh, once you guys kind of do an application with them. I add real quick to that, and how is that different from the rest of the industry, if it is? Oh, okay. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. So, um, that's a great question. It's, it's usually the most, one of the most common questions any of us are getting, you know, prior to a customer submitting an application. Um, you know, I think that the biggest thing to, to kind of understand is, you know, going back to that, that bank conversation we had before, you know, CIT bank is a, is an actual bank, you know, we're, we're the one taking a look at your credit. We're the one lending to you. Um, so understanding that, you know, we're only, we only are going to be having one pull on your credit. Um, you know, at the end of the day, one pull on your credit doesn't end up really making a, a, a huge difference and really a minimal impact to your credit. And it's pretty quick and short where it would rebound. Um, you know, the, the things to look out for is, is actually what Ross mentioned, right? The car dealership effect where you're, you're working with someone that may not be an actual bank and has many sources that they work with, uh, and your credit essentially be, gets shopped, right? Where you get several polls in a short period of time. That's where you can really see your, your credit start to take a hit. Um, so really understanding who you're working with from a lending perspective can, can be a great way to, to look at it. Um, and if we follow the journey down, uh, with, with CIT, when you, uh, when you, when you actually apply and then you get approved and we go to fund the transaction, um, it's important to understand that at least with CIT being a commercial, uh, bank, we don't actually put your, your credit line on your personal credit. Uh, we actually place it on your business credit, which right there is probably your biggest difference between us and some of the others out there where they may end up putting this on your personal credit. That's where you'll see the biggest, uh, you know, hit to your credit is when you start to take out more lines. Um, so I think, I think that's the, the biggest difference, but one put, excuse me, one credit pull by CIT isn't, isn't going to affect your credit, uh, maybe a couple points and it will rebound pretty quickly. 
So is that, and a lot of people have this question, is that considered a soft pull or a hard pull that you guys are doing? Can you kind of explain the differences between those two? Because I know those terms get thrown around a lot and I'm not sure a lot of people actually understand what they mean and, and what the difference is. Yeah, so yeah. Uh, we are doing a hard pull. Uh, go ahead, Greg, if you want to tackle this. So I was going to say, yeah, I mean, so uh, I guess the difference is like a soft pull to a hard pull. I guess the, the thought around a soft pull is like if you go check your personal credit again, you won't have an inquiry if you do a soft pull, right? When we pull credit, you will see an inquiry that CIT had an inquiry. I, I can't guarantee it, but it's my belief that a lot of times when you hear we're just going to do a soft pull, I don't know if that's always the case or not, right? I, I don't know. I mean, I don't know if, if it's the truth. I don't know what it is. I know that um, there's always people asking asking that question, right? Because we've all heard, don't pull your credit a bunch of times. Well, like, that's the key, right? Don't pull it a bunch of times. Like, don't go out and shop, you know, the, the 15 credit pulls. That will probably impact your, your credit score. If you're pulling your credit once every six months or whatever it is, that's going to have, like, no impact on it, right? So um, we definitely do a hard pull. A soft pull would be like me logging into like CreditWise or something, right? That I've like created an account yeah, with. Exactly. And, yeah, okay, Credit so Karma, any of those things, right? Way. So, and, and just actually, I'm glad you brought that up, Ross, because something that you'll want to note, and I know this from experience, right? What you see in your, in your like personal credit report, I think they're great tools. Like, don't get me wrong. Like, I look at mine all the time. I want to know, you know, is my credit trending up or down? Do I have new credit? reporting to me, you know, like what's, what's going on on my personal credit report. And Ryan, I, we might talk a little bit about that too, but, uh, on how to, how to like keep an eye on your credit. Right. Um, it's a great tool, but that score that you see, it's not always going to match. Like when someone goes to pull your actual FICO score, I mean, you, you'll probably see it. Like if you, even if you go buy a house, right. What you might see in one of those, you know, free credit bureau reporting tools, whatever that shows for a score, it may not really be what the true FICO score is that you're going to see from a mortgage lender or somebody like that. It's kind of like a best estimate. There's like a, a lot of different algorithms out there to calculate it, et cetera. Again, you know, the most important thing to look at and the things that drive your score are how much debt do you have? Are you paying your bills on time? Like that's like number one, like don't miss payments, right? Um, you know, keeping your credit card balances, you know, at a reasonable level, like those are the things to watch out for. So I'm just I'm glad you you brought up some of those tools. Like those are really important to think about even before you go do some financing for your businesses. Like what is on my credit report? And doesn't it matter too, like what credit reporting agency they're looking at, right? Because there's the big three. Which one are they looking at? Oh, yeah. Where a hard pull, you're going to look at all three of them, right? Yeah, I mean, yeah, we primarily you know we we default we look at um, Experian, but yeah, you got Experian, Equifax, TransUnion, right? Right. Um, you get all three, and those all report completely differently. That's right? right. So they all have the kind of their own algorithms, right? Exactly. Yeah, and another good question I think for people might be how many pulls in what type of a time period would be too many. Yeah, it's funny. You know, I've, I've tried to figure that out. Unfortunately, that that algorithm is complicated. Like it's it's hard. You know, I've seen people that have pulled their credit you know, a dozen times and it makes no effect. I've seen people that pull it five times and it, and it might, um, to Ryan's point earlier, it's short lived like number of inquiries. And then of course you do get to a point where if you've pulled your credit a hundred times, it's not going to keep getting worse. Like it, it's not like you can actually <laughs> pull your credit down to like a decline. You know, there's like a, there's like a few things. It's like lots of recent, like excessive recent inquiries or whatever it yeah. is. What, what the what the credit bureau is concerned with in that and like what lenders look at, they call it like credit seeking behavior. It's like right. somebody give me money. I'm getting declined yeah. everywhere. I'm going to keep shopping. It's not always the case. So like, you know, that's another thing that's important to understand. You know, when, when we're looking at a deal, it's like, geez, you know, you've, you've pulled your credit 15 times, Ross. What's going on? It's like, no, I'm buying one thing. But who I talk to, they shop me around with 15 different banks or whatever right. it is, right? So yeah. there should be a level of understanding around that because, you know, you might get a couple of credit pulls. I mean, you're going to buy a car or something like that, too. Same deal, right? You, you kind of want to get the best deal, right? Sure. So a few inquiries isn't always a bad thing, right? It's a small price to pay to make sure you're getting a good deal. But, I, you know, I would be cautious. I would just be cautious about how many times you're going to go off and, and, and do that. 
if the deal looks good and you're happy with it, like if the, the payment makes sense, it looks like it's going to make sense for your business. You probably found your deal. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't keep shopping around and ultimately cause, cause yourself more, more harm than good. Well, and think about when you're buying a house, you know, that lender is going to tell you, Hey, don't go shop for a car before this closes. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, no. And, and they're right about that. Right. I mean, because, and we, and we have people that come to us who will tell us like, you know, you can't pull my credit right now. I'm shopping for a mortgage. So that's, those are the conversations okay. that you should be comfortable having with your business lender too, right? Like, I need to buy this equipment, but I'm buying a house. Like, how? what are we going to do? Um, back to what Ryan stated too, right, earlier is even if we're looking at personal credit and we're going to do a hard pull, right, you're going to see that inquiry, we don't report that trade line on your, on your credit bureau, right? So if you are going to go buy a house, you're looking at a car, like, you're going to have that inquiry, but that's the only impact you're going to see on there. You're not going to have this trade line for all of your business equipment showing up on your credit report. Like some of these printers are expensive. Like we're financing printers for people in many cases that cost more than a home, right? Yeah. So if you're, if you're going to go off it and, and you want to buy your, your vacation house or your, your new home, when your mortgage lender looks at it, like, wow, that's a big obligation. Chances are your mortgage lender has no idea about the printing space and how this equipment pays for itself over and over again. But it's just a it's a it's a it's a thing to think about. You know, it really is. And I'm always really glad to hear you guys bring that up because, uh, you know, I used to own a small business as well. And new into as a new business owner or a small business owner, you might not even know the difference when you're you know, you're just thinking about growing your business and you need to buy something. And yeah. they're saying, hey, sign here. And what's your Social Security number? And maybe you're not thinking about that differentiation. So I'm always happy to hear you guys bring that up. When you guys yeah, have some uh, important some pretty awesome tools too, and I don't know, kind of get into what this means for our viewers, but um, corp only approvals are a thing too, where sometimes with larger companies that are more established, we can actually run them through Chris. And I know we've said that name a few times. Chris Tozier is our representative at CIT. He couldn't join us today, but uh, he, he is who you will probably talk to if, if, if you're shopping rock with us um, or, or working with our company. Um, but he's been able with some of the larger, more established companies to go in and actually look at their DNB score, which is their Dun & Bradstreet, for those of you that don't know, um, and actually get some approvals without having to use a social, you know, sometimes that comes down the road when it has to be PG, but at least it's a way for, for CIT to peek at, hey, does this look like something we could probably definitely do and, and what can it get approved for? Could you guys kind of explain how that works a little bit? Um, and when it's used and when it's not? Um, we're always looking at business credit if it's available. But to, to your point, Ross, um, you know, there are scenarios and situations where a company has used their business credit extensively where we can get an idea of, you know, what does that company look like? How do they pay their bills? I mean, that's the end of the day. That's what we're looking at. How do you pay your obligations? Um, you know, rules of thumb is we're always, you know, it's hard to tell, do I have business credit? What does it look like? Um, you know, rules of thumb, seven years time in business, you've probably had a chance to amass some sort of uh, business credit uh, is usually an area where we start. And then, you know, another generalization might be, you know, if you have more than 25 employees, that sizable company is probably one that's made some extensive loans on their business credit where we can make a decision uh, without having to look at the personal guarantor. Very cool. And so for like Steve and Denise, for example, because you guys lend against business credit and you're not putting this, uh, like we talked earlier on their personal credit, this is kind of like a, a good stepping stone then for a, a corp only type approval later down the road as they grow and they continue to pay you guys. That's just building up that business credit for them, right? Correct. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And, and you know, one of the things, you know, there's, there's, you, you talked about, um, consumer credit reporting agencies and like stuff that you can check on your own. It's difficult to find out. And Ryan mentioned this, like, what does my business credit look like? It can be difficult to figure that out, you know, and, and some people have a love hate relationship with DNB. Um, but you know, the, the, you know, Dun and Bradstreet, the important thing to note is just make sure it's accurate, right? A lot of times when we go and look at someone's Dun and Bradstreet report, it's just got the wrong information. It's got the wrong address. It's got some old business owner or like, you know, somebody moved into a location where there was another business beforehand and it gives us poor information to make a decision on. 
So it, and ultimately it might cost you something to talk to DMV and correct that stuff. Unfortunately, that's just kind of the way it is. Um, but there's not a lot of business credit reporting agencies out there for us to look at. So regardless of if everything's reporting to DMV and people are reporting trade lines, I just urge people, you know, find out if you have a business profile report, um, you know, contact Dun and Bradstreet, find out if it's accurate and make sure the information at least is correct in there. Um, and again, that's another thing, great thing to know as you're building your business and to, to check occasionally over time. Yeah, my, my experience with Dun & Bradstreet was the, not that you, you don't just open an account with Dun & Bradstreet. You manage an account with Dun & Bradstreet. And yes, they will charge right. you for it. <laughs> but it's something that's important right. for businesses as they're growing to look at and make sure that they, you know, do eventually because that is what a lot of financial institutions going to look at as they grow. And it does make it easier to get working capital loans and all sorts of other types of money, not just for equipment, but as you grow, you're going to need all kinds of different things to, to help you grow. So having that set up is, is always a good thing. So kind of moving on here, you know, one of the questions I wanted to ask was just, do you guys work with all types of credit scores? Like, is there a threshold, where should people be when they look at credit wise or they go into Credit Karma or any of those places ahead of looking for financing? What are they looking for? What What's kind of like that prime zone to be in? What's the lowest credit score where it's like, hey, maybe I should wait on this and work on fixing my credit a little bit before I, you know, go have you guys pull it? Like, can you speak a little bit to how the credit scoring works? And I know it's a pretty complex algorithm, right. but most people think of their FICO as a number. So, you know, if we're just talking between, you know, 500 and 800 being a number, like what's kind of a sweet spot and what should people think about um, before they apply? Yeah, that, that, is, that is certainly a, a loaded question there, Ross. Um, <laughs> <laughs> oh, I so, know. <laughs> so, hard questions today. So I, before I kind of give you our, our generics, you know, I think it's important to understand that, you know, all, all of our credit scores, you know, tell a story, right? And I think the important part to understand, at least working with CIT, is, you know, we try to understand what that story looks like. While I can give you some generics that, you know, you, you need to be over a, over a 650, uh, you know, and over two years' time in business to qualify for X, um, you know, I think it's important to understand that, you know, while your credit score is just a number, there's actually a lot going on, as Greg mentioned, that, that algorithm that's looking at it, right? Um, you know, how many obligations do you have? Uh, are there any delinquencies on there? Are they recent delinquencies? Are they old delinquencies, right? Those would tell you two different things. Recent delinquencies would tell you that someone's maybe having a little bit of trouble paying the obligations they have. If they're old, maybe they had it, you know, they just haven't fallen off their credit bureau. I mean, it takes a little bit of time to to really run away from a missed payment. Um, you know, I think it takes up to five years to to actually run away from a from a missed payment. So, you know, it's important to to understand that. Um, you know, I think Greg mentioned revolving balances, uh, the the credit the credit limits that you have. You know, understanding you know not to utilize. It's great to have a big balance, but you know, if you're if you're racking up that balance and you're and you're applying for financing and you're you're utilizing 70 to 80 percent of your available credit. You know that tells a story. Um, you know, so w we certainly try to understand a lot of that going into uh, reviewing some some credit. Um, but you know, generally, if 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 you need a, a barometer, um, you know, 650 and above is a good place to start when you're when you're considering applying with CIT. Awesome. No, that really helps answer the question. I know, like for me personally, and I think, you know, a lot of our listeners being small business owners, my, my credit, and I'm using a hand motion right now, but has went up and down, um, I would say considerably many times over the last few years. And, you know, it is tough to fix. You've got to dive in, you know, you've got to figure out what went wrong. I know that, you know, they've made it really convenient, uh, as of recently to, to dispute things on your credit. Now you can actually log into all the different bureaus online and dispute certain things that maybe not have been right. If you made your credit card payment on time, but it didn't report the right way or whatever the case may be. I know way back in the day when I had to, to fix it the first time before I bought my first house, I actually had to handwrite these letters and, and send them into all the bureaus 
And I kind of liked that because if they don't get back to you within 30 days of receipt, they had no choice but to wipe it off your credit, but they kind of got smart. Um, they made it more convenient, but then they made it harder to get things removed from your credit. So um, it's just definitely important, you know, for those of you listening, you know, make sure you do have a credit wise credit karma, something like that, because it not only helps you keep track of what's going on, but they actually have a ton of tools um, on those different sites to teach you how to fix your score. Um, you can run um, scenarios through those programs. It'll actually show you if I did this, this, and this, my score would potentially increase by X amount. Um, and I know, you know, a lot of times, you know, people go to these shows and they've got a dream, right? And and they get excited and they go through the whole sales pitch and they're like, oh my gosh, I want this thing. And, you know, and they go fill out some paperwork and they haven't looked at their score or thought about it in a while. No, you guys got approved, Steve. Don't raise your hand there. Yeah. You got auto approved. Don't, don't, don't even start with that. He had a dream. <laughs> he did have a dream. And that dream just came through. You know, that, that, that just happened. But uh, it's important to track those things so you don't get bummed out after the fact. We've seen too many times. And that's we want to be a part of that dream, right? We want to be a part of the excitement. We want to bust open a bottle of champagne and celebrate <laughs> you know, the business moving forward and it stinks when you get all hyped up and then you kind of have that wah, wah, wah moment and then you're trying to figure it out after the fact. So definitely important to stay proactive there. Um, that was awesome. Cool, guys. Uh, um, can I, on, I, I oh, was please. just curious. I mean, we have Steve and Denise here and I just wasn't sure if we had a, an opportunity to let them ex talk about their experience with their finance experience, basically. Basically, you did everything. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, you. <laughs> I can tell you this. You um, see these bags? <laughs> I need the nap. <laughs> um, one thing that uh, actually Greg touched on is um, when we found this deal, I did contact our local bank that we do all our, all our banking with um, since we've been open. Um, I tried to get a loan through them first and the guy was like, okay, what are you buying? I'm like a rock. So this was <laughs> did he look at you kind of funny, <laughs> Steve? Like really, you need to pull out financing? <laughs> so he texts back right, right. R-O-C-K and I'm like, oh, this isn't going to work. So <laughs> that's when I, Denise, I think reached out to you, Ross, to get, um, cause we did get approved in, in um, Atlantic city to see if we can still use that approval to get this equipment. So then Denise then, took over with emails. Yeah, Chris has been extremely helpful. Um, you know, call, we've been conversing even at night or on the weekends. Uh, he's always been there. So uh, very responsive. Yeah. So, uh, we've had nothing but. It was easy. Yeah, it, it was easy. So, well, and that was kind of the question is what was that process? So I know you guys reached out to me we gave Chris the okay to repull your credit because they were yeah. already in the system. So it was very yeah. simple for him just to say, okay, let me repull this from that happening. I mean, what was kind of the process just going through from, from, you know, a consumer standpoint, how much is the equipment? And that's what we told him. <laughs> so, um, you know, how much are you going to finance for? Yeah. Um, as soon as we had all the numbers figured out, uh, he just emailed the edocs, uh, just review and sign and it was completed uh he worked with with the other screen printing shop uh payment yeah, i was gonna say was it was it challenging at all that you were no. actually oh, buying it, used equipment from another shop how did the, it was no. it was very very smooth between both well the three parties us the other screen printing shop and um you know all you guys well, CIT. CIT and all that stuff. I mean, I don't think we even had to make one phone call. No. That's impressive. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I think, you know, to I could pump Chris up a little bit. He's not here, but I suspect he'll hear this. But I know that his customer service is outstanding and we hear it all the time. And I know that he's fearless and that he'll go out there and make those phone calls. So it's it's cool to well, hear that. Yeah. You know yeah. why Chris isn't on the podcast, right? I can almost guarantee he's on the phone with he's the working. right now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, he's working. Yeah. yeah, he's a busy guy, no doubt. We get emails from yeah. all times of the day as well. He's a hard worker. He works well, hard for his you customers. Know, the thing about, you know, knowing, knowing Chris for a long time, he actually started, I think, 
He's got about he's got about fifteen years in that building too, because he I think he's like two he started like two weeks after I did. And and the thing about Chris is like regardless of the size of your deal, like it doesn't matter if it's five grand or five hundred grand, it doesn't matter. Like he understands how important that piece of equipment is to the person buying it. Like mm-hmm. it's not always just about the size of the deal or like, you know, whatever it is. If it requires a couple of extra phone calls or whatever it is, whatever it takes, right? Because he's he's everybody's best advocate, right? And his goal is to just find a solution that works. Absolutely. So it's, uh, it's a big kudos to him. And he does work and nonstop. I, I actually wonder sometimes when Chris sleeps. Um, I sometimes get emails at, you know, two, three in the morning and I'm like, dude. Well, it's five you know. there, right? Oh, oh yeah, well, I guess, yeah. It's, it's, it's nice talking to people that when you're um, – when they're lending you money that they actually know what the equipment is and what it's worth and what it yeah. does instead of like talking to a, a local bank and they're just like, yeah, whatever. They don't even want to give you the time of the day. So it's nice knowing that these guys know, like, they, understand. What, they understand what this stuff does. So, yeah. well, we are going to take another commercial break here and we will be right back. Rock.us offers flexible finance options through your trusted lender, CIT, to help you purchase the equipment you need without a significant cash burden. We've specifically chosen to work with CIT because of their expertise in the screen printing industry and knowledge of the benefits of our equipment. With CIT, you're eligible for better rates, better terms, and better service than you might experience with other companies. To find out how easy it is to get your hands on a rock of your very own, please visit rock.us backslash pages backslash rock dash automatic dash financing. Welcome back to Rock Shop Talk, your one-stop rock shop where we will discuss all things screen printing. Today we're joined by our special guests, Stephen Denise Mangini, Greg Borden, and Ryan Max. Stephen and Denise are a primal tea shop. And Greg and Ryan here with us from CIT. Um, we are going to dive into some more awesome finance-related questions, and uh, and then we will get uh, wrapped up here for the day. So, uh, next question for you guys: I wanted to know what defines, and again, this is a loaded question. So, Ryan, before you tell me it's a loaded question again, <laughs> I'm just going to preface: it's a loaded question. Um, what defines what rate a customer will get when financing through you? And again, I know that's a very complicated algorithm that you guys use, but, you know, is it really just boil back down to the credit? I mean, how, how does that work? And then how do you work with people on rates if they're really rate sensitive, you know, which a lot, everyone is, I mean, who, who's not rate sensitive, right? So <laughs> h- how does that work? Yeah. So, um, you know, there, there are a lot of factors. I think we've, uh, we've touched on a lot of factors that go into, you know, making, making a decision on, on really the, the risk of the credit profile that, that we're looking at. Um, you know, I think it's important to understand what your credit profile looks like, right? We, we talked about obligations and delinquencies. We talked about uh, credit utilization from a revolving, revolving line, um, you know, time and business is certainly another aspect that we look at from, from a business perspective. And then also, what does your business credit profile look like, right? We, we're, we're combining everything we can find on the business, not only personal credit, but time and business and business credit to make the decision on, on you know, what type of risk that credit profile carries. Um, and then, and then try, to, try to come up with a, an acceptable rate that, that works for, for the risk given, given the credit profile. And, and would you say you guys, I mean, and this is probably hard to answer too, given the changing climate of, of interest rates and stuff, but would you say that, you know, given our industry specifically, that those rates are fairly competitive just in terms of, you know, most people think in the general sense of like, if I go to my private bank, you know, I'm going to get a better rate because I bank there or, you know, how, how does that work? How do you guys see yourselves just in terms of that landscape um, with rates? Uh, we, we're competitive. We have to be, right? It's, it's too easy now for people to, to go ahead and, and make another decision. You have to have a good product out there, right? The information is out there about, you know, what are rates, what is available. And, and I think consumers in general, everybody's so much more educated now than we were 10, 15 years ago about right. the stuff to ask and the pitfalls to look for. 
Um, so, yeah, absolutely competitive. You know, one of the things that we always say is we're comparable to bank rates, right? So, you know, you just brought up your local bank. I, I certainly think you need to have relationships with multiple lending institutions, right? Your local bank plays an important part of your business just as much as an equipment finance provider does. Um, and, you know, sometimes there's a there's a you know, sometimes there's a there's a cost benefit analysis yet analysis you might have to do on rate. Even if you might find like, okay, well this rate is maybe it's like a half a percent higher than what I think I might be able to get elsewhere. But you know what? It's not going on my personal credit. Is that worth it to you? Does that make sense? You know, um well, that's a good point. So the available. personal bank loans would actually go on someone's personal credit. So for small businesses, In many cases they do. And that's interesting because, yeah. yeah, I actually think back on, sorry to cut you off, but when I did my yeah. uh, my loan uh, for my first piece of equipment, I never really thought about it. And then I went to buy my first house after that and then was like really stumped when it wasn't on my credit. I was like, that yes, that was the happiest mistake of my life. I thought the bank actually made a mistake and they just never reported it. And I was like, oh, I've been paying all these people. I guess I don't even have a loan. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, it's it's don't important. Stop paying it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I tried that. It didn't work. I got a letter pretty quickly. No, like, <laughs> the credit cleanup. <laughs> yeah. it's, an, it's an important thing to think about, right? You know, because if you don't have business credit, you, you you're probably going to have to use some personal credit. You could probably go to your bank and get a personal loan. I mean, if it's a personal loan that you're using the business, sometimes it still might make sense to do that, right? If you don't have other options, it might make sense to do it, right? But it's important to kind of go through that, you know, weighing of your options. Um, you know, we're, we're talking a little bit about, about rates here and, like, what's a good deal. And I, I talk to a lot of people about, like, what is a good deal? Well, it depends. Like every situation might be slightly different based on the piece of equipment you, you're buying, right? Is it that you need the largest approval amount? Like, you know, it, it, can you afford to put 50% down? Because maybe you can put 50% down and you can get a lower rate, but do you have 50% cash to put down? Or, you know, maybe you, gotta, you get a super low rate, but you have to pay it back over 12 months, right? So great, I have a really low rate but it's a payment that's so high I can't afford to pay it, right? So there, there's a lot of different things at play there, and, and making an educated decision around what works best for you is, is really what you need to think about because every deal for you might Absolutely. be different, um, and, and every customer from person to person, their situation is slightly different. So a good deal, um, there are a lot of different variables in that they have to, they have to think about. Absolutely. And that kind of brings me to my next question. There's two really main types of, of loans or finance agreements that are out there. There's an FMV, which is a fair market value, correct? And there's an EFA uh, equipment finance agreement. I'm assuming I got that acronym correct as well. Hopefully. You got it. I've been doing this for a while, but sometimes, you know, you just <laughs> say the acronyms and think you know what they mean, but you have no clue. So, <laughs> You know, what are the big differences between those? Because I know in our industry, those are the two main types of, of loans that are shopped out to everyone. Some companies primarily do FMVs. Some companies primarily do EFAs. What are the, the benefits and kind of the pitfalls and things that people should really think about when they're looking, you know, at those two different types of financing? And then what do you guys typically, typically do? Yeah, so... Um, there's, you know, it's, it goes back to, you know, really understanding the lender you're working with and their capabilities. Um, so just as a blanket statement, CIT is able to do an EFA or an FMD. Um, and Ross, to answer your last question there quickly, primarily we are doing equipment finance agreements or EFAs. Um, you know, it's important to understand, you know, really what does it mean? And then also, what does it mean uh, from, a, from a tax perspective as well? Both are treated extremely different when it comes to end of year tax. And I will preface this by saying I am not a uh, certified accountant. I, I don't take my word as gospel. I've just been doing this long enough that I know the difference. Um, but they are, they are treated differently at, at come tax, tax time. So you want to understand and probably get with your accountant to figure out which may be the best option for you, whether it's a it's treated as a rental payment like an FMV would be, or if you want to write off the payments 
um, or the interest like you would be able to on an EFA. Um, some of the big differences would be an EFA, uh, the, the, the owner of the equipment would be the purchaser of the equipment. So um, I would wager to guess that Denise and Steve did an EFA. Um, so through the length of the, of the term, you guys will actually maintain ownership of the equipment versus CIT owning the equipment like we would if we had written it as an FMV. Um, so, I think that's a pretty major difference, and, and that's where it rolls into to taxes as well. So to put this in layman's terms, an EFA would be more similar to like a car loan, right, where you don't technically have the title, but you own the car, and then the bank just kind of has a lien against that car until it's paid off. So an EFA, the customer owns the equipment. So for, you know, again, I'm not a tax expert either, but for tax write-off purposes, they'd be able to do like section 179, something like that on the full purchase because they own it. And then, you know, CIT just holds a lien against that. So if people stop making their payments and, and bail out, you guys still have access to that property at that point. Um, where an F and V, um, people actually, I believe, pay sales tax on their monthly payment. Yep. So every single month there's sales tax added to that. And then at the end of the term, there's typically some kind of buyout. So you would be purchasing out that agreement from the financial financial institution, which would be determined typically before you get the note. So you might do like a 10% balloon or 15% balloon or something like that. And the amortization schedules work a little bit differently. And then you've got that monthly tax payment that you're paying as well. Did I kind of capture that okay? Just you, you got it, man. You're hired. It's all good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sure. no, I mean, you hit, I mean, so there's, there's the two things. It's a lease versus loan, right? And same deal. Like some equipment you might want to lease, some, some equipment you want to loan on it. The, the thing I, you know, when, you, when you're going through that comparison, think about how long you're going to have it for, right? I mean, the rock, like this equipment, it lasts. Right. It's not a piece of equipment that you got to refresh all the time, like really short live assets. Right. Like people go through laptops and phones like crazy. Right. You're going to go you get a phone every couple of years or whatever it is. If that right, you're going to go through some of these like IT assets often, you know, a, a piece of equipment from rock. In many cases, you're going to have it for a long time. So you probably want to own it. Right. So that's why I think so many people do an EFA. If you, if you think it's a piece of equipment that you want to upgrade over time or you need that other tax write-off, the lease might make more sense for you, right? You can compare both. Like, one of the benefits about getting approved with us is we offer both. So if you get an approval, you can kind of compare both. You can you can ask Chris and say, hey, what's the payment look like if it's an EFA? What's the payment look like if it's a, if it's a lease, right? What is it going to look like for me? And then, but, but then you do have to think about that balloon payment that you brought up, Ross, right? So there's, at the end of your lease, you've got to make a decision, right? Just like a car, like that, that piece is similar to a car lease. Like we don't track like how many miles you're putting on this thing and everything like that, right? But at the end of your three, four, five years, whatever it is, you got to make a decision. Am I going to buy this thing? Am I going to buy it out and keep it? Because you have that option. Am I going to turn it in? Because you can have that option too. Or do I want to just keep making some payments while I keep using this thing for a little bit longer? So you have some flexibility at the end. And depending on what you want to do, it might, you know, it makes sense. Talk to your accountant, you know, have a conversation with your lender. That's a, I, you know, I can't stress how important it is when you're, when you're, when you're looking at finance companies, whether it be CIT, I you know, would love to work with, with everybody. Right. But if it's, if it's CIT or if it's somebody else, make sure that, you know, you can ask those questions and you actually get answers, right? The, the person you're, the bank you're working with, they should be comfortable having those conversations with you because there's a lot of confusing terms that get thrown around. Yeah, it's a lot of acronyms, man. I've had to learn them all over acronyms. the years. It's, it's, it's oh, crazy. There, there are even more. There are, there are even more. What, you know, you, you, you made it through 101. When we get to 201, you'll learn the rest. Oh, yeah, you'll we'll get into PD scores and everything else. I know them. I'm just not <laughs> saying them because I don't want to, I don't want to dive deep into that rabbit hole, man. <laughs> so, um, you know, given where we're at right now as a country, as a world, you know, there's a lot going on with the pandemic, um, you know, how has the finance landscape sort of changed or has it changed, you know, during all this? I know, you know, businesses are pretty hard hit, you know, some doing better than others, obviously, some people pivoting into other things. You know, we, we, we do know that mortgage rates have definitely hit 
hit a low. The prime rate, I think, went down to almost nothing at a certain point in time. And I know folks thought, well, oh, my gosh, interest rates are nothing. And it's funny because when I think about it, I think about it across the board, right? I'm like, oh, I could show up to a car lot, 0%. I could show up here, 0%. But that's not really the case when it comes to lending. So what has changed or what have, have you guys seen change um, just in that landscape? Oh, it's, it's just erratic. Like, I mean, just like you're, you're seeing in the news, like everything changes day by day, right? Um, so you brought up a, a, a few things there, right? So what has changed and what continues to change, right? Um, it started out like that, that rate conversation was really early. But like when you start seeing rates get slashed like that, like the deal is like it's trying to encourage banks to keep lending, right? Because ultimately what happens, right? So you think like, okay, and this kind of – this plays back into the rate conversation we even had earlier, right? If, if people are going to pay slowly or they're going to miss payments, it impacts the bank's cash flow, right? Like everybody's thinking about how business is slow right now. We're not, we're not earning any cash, right? We're not having people coming in and spending money, so we can't make your payment to the bank. Well, if that happens, it also impacts the bank's cash flow, right? So some of those things go into weighing in, like what rate can we still continue to lend at? If we have to make collection calls and we're doing those things and, you know, we have a customer that tends to pay slow, they usually have to take a call to, to, to get current, you know, every month or whatever it is, there's a cost that we incur to that. So those are the things that factor into, like, what, why, you know, why do I have to pay any more than what the Fed's lending money at today? Or why am I not paying 0%, right? right. There's a cost of doing business there. You know, the, I thought the other, you guys just other, sat on a big pile of money underground. That's what we're oh, yeah, all under the impression yeah, right. of. <laughs> <laughs> Here much, this is your paycheck. This is that, right? That's where it's coming from. No, I mean we're we're still a business, right? I mean, you know, we've we've got to. Uh, it's 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 what we do. Um, so, like, we transfer as much as like when the, when the rates fall, like we try to give as much as we can to the customer. We want to be attractive in the market still, right? Because there's a certain point where, like, okay, you know, we don't need to. We don't need this huge margins all the time on stuff. So we're going to, we're going to work with customers on that. Right. Um, you know, what, what we, what we have been doing is just making sure we're in really good communication with customers and our suppliers, vendors like rock right during this time, understand what are you seeing in your market? What are your customers telling you? You know, what's, what's your plan? Like what's, what's your business continuity plan? Like we have to have one, like every business owner thinks, what, you know, what's going to happen next? Like, how am I going to survive this? Um, CIT, you know, we're, we're fortunate that we are big. We're, 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 a, we're a financially strong company. You know, we're publicly traded. Feel free, you know, if, you, if you're interested in looking up CIT, you know, we're, we're public, so you can find that information. Um, but, you know, we're, we're very fortunate to be in a position that, that we can weather these types of storms um, in, in, and, and, just, and just be prepared for what happens next. Um, and still be nimble, right? You know, when everything first started happening, we were so fast to get people out of our offices. You know, because we have a couple of big office park locations. Everybody was up working from home. You know, we're all working. I'm, I'm at home. Ryan's working from home right now. Um, you know, we were able to quickly pivot and do that. Um, and, and being able to weather that storm is important. Meanwhile, at the same token, right, we've got business owners calling in looking for equipment because their employees need to move move to home right so right. we had to be able to quickly pivot shift our resources to be home to help facilitate the needs of other businesses that were doing just the same exact thing um but it, it's it's uh it's interesting you know who who knows what will happen next week next month um you know industries are up industries are down it's it's um it's something that we watch every day um we we're in, we're in continuous contact with you know with legislators and, and, and trying to think through this thing on, on what's going to work best. Absolutely. You know, it, it definitely has had a lot of ups and downs. There is no way of, of knowing the future right now. I mean, we're, we're in the middle of making history. I mean, it's, it's kind of incredible to live through this moment and, and, and be a part of it and, and hopefully, you know, help be a uplifting solution to a lot of people, you know, from you guys aside, ours, I know. And um, that's, that's really cool. Um, all right. Looks like it's my turn. Yeah, hop on it. <laughs> <laughs> well, as I said at the beginning of this, I'm a big fan of keeping things simple. So <laughs> I, I wanted to circle back a little bit to the conversation just a minute ago about talking to your accountant. I think that small businesses are um, intimidated or afraid of building a relationship with your accountant. But, um, you know, 
they, you hired them. They work for you. And a lot of times accountants will not charge you for those quick conversations when you call them and ask them questions about sales tax. One of the things that we go around with with our customers is what's a tax exemption? What does it look like for my state? Do I need this? Why do I need this? And oftentimes I'll, you know, I'll circle back to saying, hey, you, you should ask those questions of your accountant because I'm not a tax advisor, but I know what my requirements are. And, and I, I definitely get feelings that customers are, are hesitant to call their accountants. So I always stress that. Don't be afraid to call your accountant. They're probably not going to charge you for every phone call. If they do, maybe you should hire a different accountant. Because <laughs> <laughs> we all know how much we pay them at tax time, right? <laughs> so there's right. that. And then another thing that I see, um, the, the deals that go through smoothly are because they've had those upfront conversations with Chris probably. They've uh, worked closely with their their salesperson on our side. Our salespeople have good relationships with the lenders. And, um, you know, they kind of, they read that paperwork and they dot their I's and they cross their T's. It's all about the details, which people don't like details. I'm an accountant. I love details. But I also understand that um, a lot of people, especially in this industry where we have a lot of creative minds, it might not be all about those details. But when you're making an investment like this, um, it's important to pay attention to those details. And what's the number, like one thing that we tend to have to like circle back, like between Rock, CIT and the customer, like what's what's kind of the number one, number two thing that kind of holds up finance or, or you know, causes kind of a lapse in like a deal getting done? I think it's because people get busy and they, they forget that they've got this big thing going on because they're busy doing their day-to-day -day job, you know, which people are working in their businesses. And I understand that a lot about this industry. So it's important to step aside and work on your business when you're thinking about a purchase like this and pay attention to your emails and answer those phone calls. And uh, I think that's really the only thing that holds things back. Absolutely. Yeah. So, um, that's, I mean, I don't have a lot of advice as far as finance pitfalls. That's really, to me, that's what it's all about. There's people there that have, you have resources, use your resources and pay attention to the details. But one thing um, that I'm curious about, and I want to go back to Stephen and Denise, is um, now that you've invested in your rock, what are your next goals? What are you, what are you planning for in your future? What are we planning for, Steve? <laughs> <laughs> um, right now, our main focus is um, keeping everything local in small businesses. So with, with everything that's gone on in these past couple of months, um, everyone wants to see our small local businesses thrive. Um, and that's really helped us. So th things have picked up quite a bit. Uh, but where we want to see ourselves well of course getting this garage done and the rent put in <laughs> I, I think that was a little jab at steve there huh <laughs> I, was, steve. Oh, uh, yeah. I, I was just told today to quit my full-time job so oh i love it wow uh, it's just that's it that's it the turning point coming, right? like absolutely keep coming so so that's our main goal is to get both of us full-time into it so yes that's so put, so put, exciting, even in this in this market. And um, why do you think you've been so successful, even through this um, pandemic? We're. I'm we, a go getter. I'm not gonna lie. I will. I talk to people. I reach out to people. I every I every day. I'm trying. I don't. I don't see it as making a sale. I see yeah. it as gaining a customer every single day. So. Um, I support uh, local racing. So like during the pandemic, I always talk to my guys that race that I help, you know, if you want shirts, you know, take your time to get them and stuff like that. Just being nice to them and everything until they're ready to place an order. So that's, and then all of a sudden when racing started coming back next uh, last week, we started getting a ton of phone calls for the racing shirts. So it's just helping out others really. Well, it's just, it's, customer service um it's not just a one and done conversation right. you know you gotta you gotta build that relationship with them and then you want to make them comfortable to where they can come to you when they're ready right yeah so, and then 
that just builds more relationships because they know more people and it just, it, it keeps coming back. So it's, it's been very good to us. <laughs> yeah, awesome. that's exciting. That's really cool to hear. That's where that alignment comes in. You know, it's so cool to, I mean, everyone's kind of said something very similar on this podcast at this point. I mean, it just boils down to the people. It boils down to the relationship and that's yeah. what matters, you know, and uh, we need that more than, than ever right now, you know, in this time that we're living in, just everyone caring about each other and trying to uplift each other and move, move lives and businesses forward. And, and that's, that's really awesome. Um, okay, so. Sounds like you're going to have to cross some coals though, Steve, like, <laughs> go light some on the ground, <laughs> listen to Tony Robbins for a minute, take off your shoes, walk across and then scream, I quit my job and then you go. <laughs> well, yeah. how about how about a quick plug for your business too, where you're at and how people can find you? Um, we are on Instagram, um, Primal Tea Shop. Uh, we are also Facebook, uh, PrimalTeaShop.com. Uh, yeah, shoot us an email, text message, Facebook. Uh, we're at um, 315-558-8640. So... All yeah, right. Awesome. So I'll go help us uh, support uh, Rhoda, the new rock press <laughs> yeah. over at yeah. uh, Primal Tea Shop with Stephen it. Denise. That's awesome. Yeah. How about you guys at CIT? How do people find you? <laughs> well, you want to find Chris usually, <laughs> but. Uh, okay. Well, I'm, 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 well I'm, I know I'm, that people so can I'm find you through our website. We know that, but. Yeah. Yeah. Through, through the rock website. I mean, and it's simple, right? I, I, CIT.com, right? You'll you'll find us there. You'll find a lot of information there. Um, certainly reach it, reach out to the team at at Rock. They'll, they'll get you pointed in the right direction. Um, and uh, I think that's probably the best way to find us is probably CIT.com. And, it, and if and if you want um, if you want to get a hold of Chris, you can call 603-766-9394. Very cool. Well, like we already right. said, he, he answers at <laughs> all times of the day, I think, is how that goes. He does. That's awesome. Yeah, and yep. pretty soon, hopefully, we'll all be back at maybe some industry trade shows, maybe by the end of the year. We'll maybe. see how, you know, this pandemic rolls out. And um, otherwise, next year, you know, for sure, we'll all be there. And CIT definitely joins us at all of our booths, all of our uh, partners' booths as well. Um, look for our partners online if we're not showing somewhere Um one of our, our partners definitely will be. So great place to meet the CIT team. Um, you know, they might take you out and buy you a beer or something. They're, they're kind of fun to hang out with. So Give drink tickets. Yeah. Good, good group of folks. <laughs> and uh, we'll, we'll go ahead and wrap up here. I want to thank uh, Stephen Denise from Primal Tea Shop for joining us today. Greg Borden, Ryan Mack from CIT for joining us and Miss Shelley and Mr. Muriel Caps for joining us as well. Um, it's been fun. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Thank you. thank you all. As always, thank you for spending time with us this week. Tune in next week or at your convenience on wherever you listen to your podcast by searching Rock Shop Talk. That's R-O-Q Shop Talk. On our next show, we'll dive into the digital space and the future of screen printing. If you'd like to join the live Zoom hangout or even request to be on the show, please visit rock.us forward slash rock shop talk. That's R-O-Q dot us forward slash roq shop talk if you found today's episode helpful the greatest accolade we could ask for is for you to recommend it to a friend who may find it helpful as well please like share and subscribe on facebook youtube linkedin twitter and instagram until next time rockers press on rockers.